and we're going to look at Judaism. Uh, we said that both Islam and the Christian faith trace their spiritual origins back to Abraham, as well as Judaism does the same thing. And so we think of these three faith movements, which comprises half of the world's people, as being Abrahamic faiths. Now there's debate among these three communities as to whether uh, the alternative communities really understand the faith of Abraham. Uh, Jews would like to think probably that they understand the faith of Abraham best and Muslims would view themselves and Christians likewise. And so sometimes there's discussion about that. But having said that, all three of these movements do believe that there's one God only um, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, who is the God of Abraham, whom they seek to follow and to, um, and to worship. So let's look, at, let's look a little bit at, um, at, at Judaism. Of course, it's uh, the Old Testament portion of the Christian Bible is, is Jewish. It's been contributed by Israel to, uh, to, to, to the whole world. And so uh, uh, when I go to a synagogue and they read from their scriptures, they're always reading from the Old Testament, which I have in my own Bible, you see. So we have that portion of the Christian scriptures is, comes to us from, from, the Jewish, from the Jewish movement. Now, God had promised Abraham uh, that uh, this land of Canaan that he went to when he left Haran, that he will give this to his progeny forever. And um, so there's a lot of discussion uh, about that promise uh, today among Jewish people and among Christians as well. I was just very recently in a meeting uh, where there was a Palestinian Christian present from Bethlehem. And we had two weeks with him going from churches and colleges, universities, and so forth, where he was presenting uh, their understanding of this as, as uh, Arab believers in Jesus, Christians, uh, of this promise of God to Abraham for land. It's a very significant question, which is under much, much, much discussion. And so Israel occupies the land, having left Egypt. We talked about that the other day. And they set up a political state. They installed kings. Uh, they eventually built a temple to God uh, under King Solomon and uh, are prospering, doing very well. But then in 586, they are taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And their kingdom is abolished. There's no more king on David's throne. God had promised David, we mentioned this the other day, that his progeny will reign forever. There's no more king on David's throne. And as I said, the temple is no more. It is a cataclysmic time. This is referred to as the exile. You cannot exaggerate the theological crisis that all of this created. Here, this land, they believe, has been promised to them. And they're now slaves, refugees in a foreign land. They sit on the riverbanks of Babylon and they weep and weep as to what has befallen them. And the answer that the prophets give to this calamity is that they have not been faithful to God. They have the scriptures, at least a portion of it at that time. It wasn't all written yet. God has instructed them on his righteous ways, and they have abandoned God. The center of the Jewish faith is called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's the Shema, the proclamation. They had abandoned that truth and had worshipped other gods. They had betrayed God's righteous decrees. That's what the prophet said. That's the reason for this uh, exile. And they repented. They repented very deeply. In fact, after the exile, Israel never ever again returned to the worship of idolatry. Never. So there was a very deep repentance touched that whole nation as they turned away from the worship of many gods 
which they had been practicing up until the exile. When they went into the exile, they stopped that absolutely. And God intervened, as, and they were permitted to return, little by little. Seventy years after the exile, they were permitted to return. And uh, they returned under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. They were the two prophets, the two political leaders and, and priestly leaders. Ezra was the priest and Nehemiah the political leader. Uh, returned and led people back. And so it's exile and return. And uh, reconstructed the temple and reinstituted the worship of God and uh, began to read the scriptures regularly and began to record scriptures, um, get their records clear, get their history clear, get the story clear. Um, and all of that is taking place in the Ezra Nehemiah reforms. And Israel believes that as they really submit to God faithfully, why he will protect them from such a calamity again. That exile and return is so significant that this is another one of these root events that create continual astonishment in the souls of Israel. Why could this have happened? And in the restoration, how can we really follow through on obeying God as we should? That's the question. Now, during that exile and return, there are many, many prophets. There's quite a number of prophets who are speaking about a future hope that this exile and return is a preparation for the promised Messiah, the son of David who will come. When you read Ezekiel and Jeremiah and, and, uh, and Daniel and uh, uh, Isaiah and uh, Zechariah and on and on, these prophets, just one after the other, holds forth this vision of the coming of the messianic reign when truth and righteousness will encompass the whole world. It's a very, very anticipatory time. Uh, let me uh, just, just read uh, one, one of many, many passages in the Old Testament about this. Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord and on and on, describing his righteous reign. What does it mean, a shoot coming from Jesse? A shoot, a little bit of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a sprig of greenery from the, the, of a tree that has been cut down. That's the picture. A tree's been cut down, but now some greenery, some signs of life are reappearing in that tree. And what is this tree that was cut down? It was Jesse's tree. Who's Jesse? Jesse is the father of David. And so this refers to the promise of God to David that, that he, will, he, will, he will appear, he will come, that this shoot will come forth. Don't, don't be discouraged. Although there's no king on David's line, the Savior will come eventually. The Messiah will come. And um, not only will this shoot from David come and bless Israel, but we read, in that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples the nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. So it's not only Israel that will be brought into the blessing of the messianic reign, all nations will be invited and included in this, in this reign. So it's those sorts of passages which uh, just burst forth over and over again uh, by these uh, prof prophets of the exile and the prophets after the exile as well. <clears throat> And finally, as we said last time, uh, as we said earlier on, why uh, the angel Gabriel appears to this virgin, Mary, who is of David's line, and promises that she will give birth to this promised Messiah. She is overwhelmed. We read the passage when we talked about that and amazed that God is fulfilling his promise now to Israel. And so Jesus appears. And Israel was divided about Jesus. Um, is he really the Messiah or is he not? And that division eventually led to his crucifixion. Um, so it was never sort of a clean, clear-cut consensus that this is indeed the promised Messiah. Uh, his life and ministry was steeped in controversy. And that continues to this very day. 
that Israel is divided about the Messiah. There are those who would say, yes, he is the promised Messiah. And others would say, yes, but when the Messiah comes, there will be, there, there will be peace in the whole world, and the peace has not yet come. <laughs> so how can he be the Messiah? And that kind of discussion, you know. It's not just a Jewish discussion. It's a discussion all over the world. This Jesus. Of course, the Christian response is, wherever people say yes to Jesus, his peace comes. But he doesn't force his peace on anybody. It's a peace that needs to be received, but it's not coerced. We're free to choose yes or no to that peace. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.